Our next training topic is safety protocols and demolition fall protection. I will now hand it over to Tim. Thank you, Larry. As Larry mentioned, we're going to be talking about fall protection today. And this presentation was developed in partnership with the National Demolition Association. Training participants will review an introduction to the NDA, the National Demolition Association. We'll look at some standards and references, fall protection training and planning, and types of fall protection used in demolition. The NDA, or National Demolition Association, represents nearly 500 firms, and there are more than 400,000 employees across the industry. Our mission is to provide members with the tools necessary to be leaders in environmental stewardship, safety, education, professional competency, and government advocacy. Our vision is to be recognized worldwide as the source of all things demolition while serving our industry. The latest safety resources developed by the NDA provide on-the-job safety training to their employees. And the resources include the Safety Handbook, which was initially developed from a grant partnership with OSHA, Robotics, Pre-Engineering Survey, the National Demolition Association Safety App, which provides you over 70 safety talks, including a job hazard analysis, guidance documents that include the High Reach Guidance Document, and ANSI and other standards for safe health requirements for demolition operations. And then there's my favorite, the recently developed Foundations of Demolition Management course. So this is a 40-hour certificate course. It's done live in classrooms, and I have the honor of being one of those facilitators currently, as myself and many other leaders in the industry volunteered many hours to the development of this invaluable training. This training is broken up into four modules. The first one, demolition estimating. The second one, demolition project management. Third, demolition job cost tracking. And my favorite of the four, demolition risk management. As mentioned, Tim Barker with AECOM, the program manager of our T4 services with over 30 years of experience in the demolition industry. I was with one of the big three demo contractors in the world for a few decades before I spent the last decade here at AECOM. As I say, it takes one to know one, or at least to manage and help one succeed, as I tremendously enjoy serving owners and working with best-in-class demolition contractors on some of the largest, most complicated projects in the industry. I'm the program director of our decommissioning group, which encompasses plant deactivation, decontamination, and demolition, thus the acronym D4. I also lead up our Demolition Center of Excellence as our technical practice group leader for AECOM. For more information on these or other resources, please contact the Demolition Association at demolitionassociation.com or call us at 202-367-1152 to learn more. I start most of my presentations with a safety moment. And today, I'm going to draw from one that's personal. Matter of fact, most of the safety moments that I present often have a personal touch. And the reason why is a fact without a good story or a good point is quickly forgotten. And so, for those who have listened to the earlier module on pre-engineering survey and the safety reasons behind requiring them and, and utilizing them, I'm going to draw from that safety moment and add to it. That safety moment occurred 28 years ago when I was a young, really a young and dumb project manager, thought I knew it all. I was responsible for the, some 30, 40 people on the site. One particular person who was approximately the same age as I was at the time was expecting his first daughter, and so was I. Unfortunately, she never had the opportunity to meet her dad. And after that fatality that occurred on that site, I said, if, if I stay in this industry, and it was a big if, that could never happen again. Interestingly, it was related to fall protection, which we'll be discussing today. Now, on top of that, I mentioned that I was expecting my first daughter. Seven years ago, that daughter, my oldest child of five, was in a paralyzing accident. She was up on a roof in Chicago where she was going to school her junior year and stepped on what she thought to be a secure board on a roof. Actually, it was a hole that dropped three foot below where she fell to incur her paralyzing accident. It was a hole that should have had a two-code skylight. Had it had a two-code skylight, uh, she would not be paralyzed today. So the standards and references for fall protection and demolition include 29 CFR 1926 subpart C, training, which is what we're doing today, that the employer has a responsibility to train employees. And this training goes well beyond 
the training that's provided through OSHA, the 10-hour, 30-hour, or the National Demolition Association 40-hour certificate. This is a site and scope-specific training cited for not having on that incident 28 years ago. Additionally, fault protection. This was the other item that I was cited for uh, from that incident, 29 CFR 1926. And then ultimately, subpart T demolition, which begins, interestingly, with 1926.850A, which is the pre-engineering survey, which had we had performed one and included the hazards that I had talked about in the pre-engineering module, I think we could have also potentially prevented the incident that occurred on that site. Fall protection training and planning. Again, as I just mentioned, there are fall protection training classes available, but in the demolition and other industries, that's a good starting point. It also needs to be site scope specific for the hazards that you encounter on the job site. Starting here with 1926.501, duty to have fall protection. Employees shall be protected from falls of six foot or greater with guardrail systems, personal fall arrest devices, or positioning devices. These systems are to be provided for by the employer. That means they can't put that responsibility on the worker. The employer needs to provide the equipment, needs to be well maintained, needs to be stored properly, and it needs to be inspected on a regular basis. As seen in this example here, there are some unique risk of leading and sharp edges. For example, the fall distance when working on an elevated platform. If there's fortunately nothing to tie off to above you, Oftentimes, you may have to tie off at your feet elevation. Problem with this is it increases the distance that you're going to fall before your shock-resistant lanyard or retractable device activates and prevents you from falling a further distance, as seen in the first example in the diagram. In the second, you can see that there's a required time to reach velocity to engage the lifeline. And it takes longer when you're tied off at your feet than it does if you were tied off above your head. This is a problem. Obviously, you are falling further before your fall stops you. And then three, the increased fall arrest forces. Well, they're exponentially greater the further you fall, as seen here in the diagram. Potential higher impact to the body when the fall is arrested is far greater when you fall at a higher or further distance than if you just were to fall a couple feet. And then four, the increased potential to swing hazards is dramatically increased when you're tied off, not directly above or below where you're working. Ideally, you're tied off directly above your working area, but if you begin to move over to the left or the right, you fall. Obviously, it could result in you swinging into maybe a sharp object or a fixed object that could create additional hazards for you. Fault protection training requirements in 1926.503 states that the employer shall provide a training program for each employee who might be exposed to fall hazards. The program shall enable each employee to recognize the hazards of falling and shall train each employee in the procedures to be followed in order to minimize these hazards. The employer is responsible to assure that employees are trained and as necessary by a competent person qualified in the areas necessary to the employee's scope of work. We talked extensively about the requirements of a competent person in the engineering survey. I also, in that safety moment, talked about how if we had provided separate tie-off location for the worker above the work area, that that worker would be alive today. Fortunately, he had tied off adjacent to him, not immediately above, but just above and just off to the right as compared to tying off at the floor. But then as he worked his way over, he, in essence, cut the, the limb that he was standing on. He cut a piece of steel that he was tied to. And, and as it was cut loose, it pulled him into the bottom of the blast furnace. So again, the tie-off location is extremely important. Ideally, it's above the worker. And as you can see here in the two examples in this diagram, the first one is a shock-absorbing lanyard. With this lanyard, the worker could fall in excess of 12, 16, 18 feet before they completely stop seen in this example. Whereas to the right, the retractable lanyard limits this distance substantially. That reduces the shock on the body, on the worker. Types of fall protection used in demolition include guardrail systems. They're installed to provide a physical barrier to protect employees from falling, such as a top rail between 39 inches and 45 inches tall. After the top rail is installed, then the mid rail is placed at the midpoint, and then lastly, the tow board, which is at least three and a half inches tall, 
a standard two by four would work. Wood, chain, wire rope can all be used for top and mid rails, but keep in mind if you do that with chain or wire rope, that it needs to be taut. It needs to be able to withstand a few hundred pounds of pressure, lateral pressure. It cannot be loosely draped between two columns. Shop built and filled assembly options are available also for contractors to use. Types of fall protection used in demolition? Well, the personal fall arrest system, as seen here, is a system consisting of three components that prevents the employees from falling greater than six feet. Minimum personal fall arrest system requirements, well, no free fall for more than six feet, prompt rescue after a fall, inspected by a competent person prior to each use. Components of a personal fall arrest system include anchorage, lifeline, body harness. Positioning device systems are also available. We recently had a project where there were some asbestos components that need to be removed from lighting fixtures. They were 50 to 60 feet at the top of a boiler. The only way the workers could safely get to these areas is to fix ropes and then climb ropes. We had professional rock climbers that worked for a company that this is what they did. And they had to work up into these areas before they started each day. We had to look at their fall arrest systems to make sure they were, could not fall more than six feet as they worked their way from the floor to the top of the truss. We had to make sure that we had a backup person or a plan to be able to rescue them if they were to fall. And then again, inspected by a competent person to make sure that the equipment wasn't expired or damaged or maybe covered in oil or some other chemical that could damage a harness or a lifeline. What is different about fall protection and demolition? Well, you cannot always install a permanent guardrail system since leading edge areas are being reduced instead of increased. So let me explain that. You can the structure from the outer edge working your way back if you're in a tight downtown area. And so that leading edge is actually disappearing. It's not increasing as you work throughout the project. As such, opposite planning and sequencing is required as you reduce the height of the structure instead of increasing it. Purposely creating potential fall hazards as part of the scope of work requires constant pre-planning and adjustment of fall protection plans as you work your way through these hazards. In this case, study number one was an unprotected wall opening resulted in a fatality. The incident details include at 9.45 a.m. on July 31st, 2018, employee one was performing interior demolition work at an elevated work area inside a partially demolished building structure. He had placed a heavy motor at the edge of an unprotected wall opening, 31 feet above the ground, with half of the motor hanging off the edge. With the assistance of two coworkers, they pushed the motor off the edge. The motor caught on the employee's sleeve or his glove, pulling him through the wall opening to the ground below. No guardrails or other fall protection were observed in the area. There was a barrier at the wall opening, which was a steel A-frame that went from floor to ceiling. Employee one sustained a chest compression injury after falling and striking an exterior steel railing stair railing that was approximately 17 feet above the ground. He was killed. In this case study number one, the fall prevention options were a guardrail system should have been installed at the wall openings to prevent the fall hazards. When items are intentionally dropped from above 20 feet surrounding grade, they should be controlled with the use of a chute or hoist. This pertains to buildings that are not being completely demolished by mechanical means. That means an excavator with a bucket or a grapple, maybe at a safe distance, bringing it down. Number three here, personal fall arrest systems or positioning device should be utilized when there are unprotected edges with the potential to fall six feet or greater. In this case, recommendation would be to implement a monitored control access zone when guardrails need to be removed for hoisting and lowering debris. Employees within the access zone would be required to utilize personal fall arrest system or positioning devices 100% of the time. Incident details in case study number two of a leading edge fall fatality include at 9 a.m. on October 29, 2018, an employee was cutting metal roof sheets. The employee walked onto the free floating end of a metal roof sheet, fell through onto the concrete floor below, and was killed. 
Fall prevention options include a personal fall arrest system should have been utilized to prevent the falls greater than six feet. Two, when cutting back a supported deck, it is always best to tie off from above to avoid leading and sharp edge concerns. Three, utilizing at self-retracting lanyard system connected to a full body harness is recommended when possible. Four, never use shock absorbing lanyards with self-retracting devices. Case study number three, unprotected floor openings that resulted in an eight-foot fall fatality. The incident details include at 12.45 p.m. on November 9, 2015, employee number one, employed by a consulting service company, was engaged in demolition work at a warehouse. He was dismantling shelves when he fell from an unprotected opening to the concrete floor below, a fall only eight feet, but employee number one sustained a head injury and he was killed. The fall prevention options include number one, fall protection plan must be implemented when fall risk of six feet or greater are present. All floor openings shall be covered or protected with guardrails. Three, if floor openings are being utilized to lower or drop materials, then a monitored access zone or personal fall arrest system must be utilized to prevent falls. That concludes this presentation, and for more information, you can contact National Demolition Association at www.demolitionassociation.com or call us at 202-367-1152. Thank you. Tim, there were a few questions that came up for the safety protocols and demolition fall prevention topic. Question number one, how often does fall protection equipment need to be inspected? Fall protection equipment should be inspected prior to each use. Then we have another question. If a harness is damaged and or missing its manufacturer's tag, can it be used? No. On behalf of the Director of Training and Education, I would like to thank again Tim Barker and Don Collier and the National Demolition Association for providing this valuable training. This concludes the training session, and I hope everyone stays safe and healthy out there.